almost forget to turn the microphone on, and you probably wish I would. Amen. <laughs> Exodus chapter 2. While you're finding that, let me be a little bit on the lighter side this morning. Uh, how many of you remember me speaking about Penny Crosby last week? Mama. And do you notice that Nicole chose a Penny Crosby song today? <laughs> She either wanted to hear me preach for a long time or she forgot uh, what I said about that. The church we uh, came from in Florida would have never, they might have sang a Fanny Crosby song for an invitation, maybe not before I preached. They always thought I'd preach longer, but that's, you know, that's one of those things. They, they weren't very smart. They let me get away. <laughs> While you're finding your place this morning on the latter side, uh, Nicole, you missed a great opportunity with that picture of Brother Ronnie with his hair on. If you had made that picture, you could have sold that and people would have paid enough for it that you would have had plenty of funds for your air conditioning. <laughs> Now let's move to the serious side for just a moment, just before we read your text. How many of you have your mother present with you in the auditorium today? You know what I would do if I see her? I'd scoot over real close to her and I'd hug her up and I'd whisper in her ear. I'm sure we all would love to be able to do that. For some of us, it's been a long time now. And all we have is memories. But the more memories you make while mom's still living, the more memories you're going to have when she's gone. Oh, what would we give today just to be able to do that once again? Exodus chapter 2. We're going to share a story with you this morning, and I've entitled this message, and I always I always hate to tell you that there's two or three or four points because you get you get scared it's going to take too long. But uh, I entitled the message this morning, The Three Traits of a Godly Woman. Every Free Will Baptist message I was told years ago needed to have at least three points and a poem. Well, I don't have a poem this morning. I have three points, but I have one line from a poem, okay? So maybe that will suffice. Exodus chapter 2. We, we're going to find within this passage of Scripture a woman that perfectly paints a picture of what a godly mother should be. Exodus chapter 2, you're so familiar with this passage, I'm sure. And it says, There went a man of the house of Levi and took to wife a daughter of Levi. And the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him, that he was a godly child, she hid him three months. And when she could not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and dobbed it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein. And she laid it in the flags by the river brink. And his sister stood afar off to wit what would be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, Flag, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she had opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wailed. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrews' children. Then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter, Shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women, that she may nurse the child for thee? And Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called to the Pharaoh, the child's mother. And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the women took the child and nursed it. And the child grew, and she brought him unto Pharaoh's daughter. And he became her son, and she called his name Moses, and said, Because I drew him out of the water. I heard someone, or read someone just this past week, that said, On this Mother's Day, we ought to preach a message praising all of our mothers instead of condemning them. I think I understand what he's trying to convey 
However, I'm not sure that I totally agree with what he said. You see, for us to preach a message of condemnation is not biblical at all. We have no authority whatsoever, you or I, have no authority whatsoever to condemn somebody. However, we do have the authority to praise someone. Right. So, there's two reasons that I feel like that uh, I make that statement, and one of them is, again, because only God alone can, can condemn and secondly, because I don't think Mother's Day is the only day that we ought to praise our mothers. In Proverbs 31, there's a long list of reasons why we should give honor to our mothers. Now, after you go home, maybe you'll read that again for yourself, and I'm sure that you have already, but... Solomon, in his wisdom, lists all the traits of a mother. And if we preach those this morning, then certainly be more than, than three. We men, now, often on Mother's Day when I preach a message, uh, I'm rough enough on the men that the next Sunday the ladies will try to pay, pay me to preach that message again. <laughs> And I'm not going to be too rough on the men this morning, but we men like for the world to know that we're the breadwinners. And sometimes we stick our chest out and we say, bless God, I bring the bacon home. But if we read in Proverbs 31, we'll find out that the mother holds a little bit more authority because we may be the breadwinners, but she's the homemaker. You see, we may bring the flour home, but I kind of like the biscuits that Mom makes. How about you? Can you imagine eating that flour all by itself? But it sure does make some good. As we used to have an old fellow over in Cookville years ago, the first church that we ever pastored, Brother L.K. Godsey used to say that Mama made those uh, choked off biscuits. Roll up that flour and squeeze off just enough to make a biscuit with some of you ladies may remember that. And so he called it choked off biscuits. So we may bring the flour home, but it's mama that makes the biscuits. And it's important for us to remember that. Breadwinners? Yeah, we may be. But think about the position of mom in the house. First of all, the things that I think about is she runs a restaurant. She cooks the meals every day. I know how it is. I, don't, don't you tell my wife that I'm saying this, okay? Maybe she can't hear me. So don't tell her that I'm saying it. Don't remind her at least. But I remember the day of coming home and I finished my day. And I come home and there's a meal on the table. The house is clean. And my wife cleans house so much and she moves furniture every time she cleans and used to, I had to be very careful about where I sat down or I missed my chair because it's not where it was yesterday. <laughs> I mean, she cleaned every day. And so the wife runner or the mother runs the maid service in the home. She runs the restaurant. She's often found as the school teacher, the peacekeeper, the doctor, and the nurse. And sometimes she has to become jailed and jailed. And the warden after she throws us in jail. <laughs> so you see, she has a big job. And we have the small job. We just simply bring the bacon home. Many times I've heard ladies say, that, and, and besides I should say, that often they do that working outside the home just like we do. Now there was a day when men had chores outside, but anymore, it's not hardly so. Men often come home and that's the end of their day. Take a shower, 
eat the meal the wife cooked, and go to bed and sleep on the clean sheets that she put on the bed, and they forget that she worked all day long in the factory or in the office just like they did. But her job wasn't done and she got home. And I think we need to remember that. A lot of times when we, a lady's asked, and I've heard it said so many times, and what do you do? And she'll respond, oh, I'm just a homemaker. I always call them domestic engineers because they find out how to do so many things. But they'll use that term as if it's so unimportant. I'm just a homemaker. Well, they're much more than a homemaker. It's the mother that often takes the girls and the boys and makes women and men out of them. Oh yes, girls are usually daddy's girls and boys are usually mama's boys, but in the end, it's the mother that has to train them to grow up to be women and men, more so than the dad does. Might have been different in your home, but I seriously doubt it this morning. I promised you a, one line of a poem. Well, uh, Ralph Waldo Emerson said it this way. He said, men are what their mothers make them. General Patton, yeah, I know, old vulgar Patton, but he had great respect for his mother. And he had great respect for the soldiers that he commanded for their mothers. And he says, don't you ever think and this might not be word for word, but he said, don't you ever think that the strength of the military lies within its soldier? He said, not so. The strength of the American military lies within the soldier's mother. Those soldiers are good soldiers because their mother trained them to be good men. I hear about the problems that they have in the military today. And I don't understand that. Men are going in and, and a lot of times just get kicked out of service because they can't adjust to military service and they get bad discharges. In the day that I went in the military, we didn't have near that problem. Because as young boys, we respected authority. Because mom was the authority figure at home and she made sure that we, we respected authority. And so they had no problem with us. Yes, men are what their mothers make. In this story that we've read today, there's a lady that's mentioned that, although it doesn't call her name, but we still get a good picture of what a godly mother should be. In the book of Hebrews in chapter 23 and chapter 11, I'm sorry, the roll call of faith, God saw the mother of this woman being so important that he listed her in that roll call of faith in verse 23. In Numbers chapter 26 and verse 59, we find out that that mother that we're reading about, her name was Jochebed. She was a Levite. She would have married her uncle. And she gave birth to a son called Moses. Now, Jacobed, the meaning of Jacobed is God is glory, or Yahweh is glory, which is God is glory. The nation of Israel for 400 years, almost 400 years at this time, had, at the time of our story, had been in Egypt. You see, they left Canaan because there was no, there was a famine in Canaan and there was no way they could provide for themselves and they went down to Egypt at the welcome of the Pharaoh because the Pharaoh loved Joseph, one of the sons. And he invited Israel to come down to Egypt 
where they could do very well. And actually, he gave them the land of Goshen, which was a land that was great for cattle, and they began to multiply to live extremely well. But after a while, this Pharaoh dies that likes Joseph, and a new Pharaoh comes on the scene, and he begins to get scared. And he says, these Hebrews are going to grow to the point that they outnumber us and we've got to do something to put an end to this. And he said, that's something that we're going to do is we're going to make slaves out of them. And so he made slaves out of them and, and they built great cities for him. And, and, but they began, even under the hardship, he'd work them day and night, and under the hardship they still multiplied to the point that he saw these Hebrews taking over the Egyptians. And he says, we've got to do something. And so he orders the midwives that when a child is born, that they're to kill that child. And the midwives so feared God that they refused to do it. And so Pharaoh has to devise another plan. And the second plan was that he would instruct his people that when they saw a young Hebrew child that was just born, that they would take that child and they would throw it into the Nile River and get rid of it. And so Jacobed already had two children. That was Miriam and Aaron. And so when Moses was born... The scripture said she saw he was a proper child and she decided because she feared God, she says, I'm going to protect my child. I'm not going to allow him to be thrown into the river. I'm not going to allow him to be killed. You see, that's what godly mothers do. They stand up for their children regardless. No matter what the cost is, godly mothers are always beside their children, taking care of them, doing whatever they can. And I realize that in America today, mothers are faced with a terrible task. Even more so than our mothers were. Those of you that are near my age, I, maybe there's some of you in here almost as old as I am. They didn't have as many things that they had to deal with as mothers do today. You see, when I was growing up, there was no TV for us to watch violence on. There was not people out there that were running around looking for some child that they could molest. There were no adults that were always trying to get young people in trouble. In fact, in the community that I lived in, everybody in the community watched out for everybody else's child. And if we were at the neighbor's house and we did something that we shouldn't do, guess what? They didn't send us home to get... I almost said a spanking. We didn't get a spanking. We got a whipping. <laughs> they didn't send us home to get it, but the neighbor would go ahead and do it. And then when they would send us home, they would tell mom and dad that they had already whipped us. And guess what? We got another one. We shouldn't have been ugly at the neighbor's house. You see, people watched out for people then. But today, there's all kinds of things that's taking place. Kids are not being thrown into the river. Well, in some cases they may be. Little boy, they're looking for what is it, Nashville now? Little Joe? They don't know where he's at. Beat up by a dad that didn't care for him while a mom stood by and watched it. Godly mothers don't do that. Godly mothers would have given her life for that son. The importance being a godly mother. You see, someone needed to stand up in Egypt and say enough is enough. And Yaakov said, I'm going to be that person. 
In America today, we need somebody that's going to stand up and say enough is enough. And I'm going to be that person. And let me tell you, me and I have all respect for you. But most of the time, that someone that has to stand up is a woman. Do you know why some of our churches are now ordaining, and I'm not talking about free will Baptist, but I'm talking about some churches are ordaining women to preach because they can't find enough men that will? Is it because God's not called them? Very doubtful. It's because they don't answer. Why do we have in our churches ladies that teach Sunday school class and especially men's places because men won't do it. I'm not going to condemn those ladies for doing that. I'm going to praise them for stepping up and doing what they can because they're not willing to see their children be lost to a corrupt world. There's about three things I want you to see about this woman you off the bed. One of them is that she was certainly a protector of her child. In verses 2 and 3 it says, And the woman conceived and bare a son, and when she saw him that he was a godly child, she hid in three months. And when she could no long, not longer hide him, she took for him an ark of bulrushes and dotted it with slime and with pitch and put the child therein, and she laid it in the flags by the riverbank. She did what she could. Two things that I want us to see in that passage of Scripture that it mentions, one of them is she made an ark. The amazing thing about this word ark in this passage of Scripture comes from the same Hebrew word that we find where Moses, or where Noah, made an ark. He made an ark for the safety of those people that would listen. Now, Peter tells us that Noah was a preacher of righteousness. The scripture tells us in Genesis chapter 6 that God gave him 120 years to build that ark. So I'm to believe that in 120 years, Noah preached to those people righteousness. And only those that would listen were brought inside the ark. So the ark was a place of safety. And by the way, that was his family. The ark was a place of safety. We find that ark in Jesus Christ today. He is our place of safety. He's the place that godly mothers bring their children to. They prepare for their children an ark. They prepare by living the gospel in front of them. The greatest message that you could ever preach, ladies, is to live a godly life in front of your children. It's more important than anything I would ever say here today or Brother Ronnie would ever say to you or for that matter, anybody else that ever preaches the gospel. Just live a godly life in front of them. Secondly, the scripture says in verse 3 that she daubed that ark with slime and pitch. This word pitch came, comes from the same word again that's used in the story of Noah and his ark when he, when he pitched the ark within and without, it says, with pitch. It was used to seal up the water. Now, Bible scholars know that when we see the word pitch used in this passage, or we see it used in the, in the story of Noah and the ark, then we understand that he's talking about the Holy Spirit. You see, the, spit, the pitch was used to keep the water from going through the cracks. Now, we've probably never done that. I do remember having an old John boat one time, and I was trying to fish out of it on a pond, and there was water that kept seeping in that old John boat right over here at Cumberland Youth Camp. Brother Mary Pettis 
back years ago. Was the caretaker over there. Brought the camp. The old John boat was leaking. I got some tar that Brother Pettis had in the can. And I put it on the outside of old John, our old John boat and I put it on the inside and I got back in it and I fished all day. It keeps the water out. That's what the pinch was used for when, when Yonkabed built the ark. She had to put the pinch on it to keep the water from coming inside. Well, when Jesus was about to go away in John chapter 14 and he recognized that his disciples were troubled he told them, he said, Let not your heart be troubled, neither let it be afraid. But further down in that passage of Scripture, he said, When I go away, I'll send you another comforter, which is the Holy Ghost. You see, the Holy Ghost was to direct them or keep them safe. The pinch was used to keep baby Moses safe. And so the Holy Spirit keeps us today, shields us from the storms of this life that are coming and do come upon us. You see, any godly mother knows that it's important to bring her children to Jesus and teach them about the power of the Holy Spirit to keep them. Even after our children are saved, moms, they still have a world to contend with. And they need the Holy Spirit to shield them. And so you teach them about the Holy Spirit. Second trait we find in this passage of Scripture is that Yaakovah provides for her children, for her child. Verse 4 it says, And her sister stood afar off to whip what should be done to him. And the daughter of Pharaoh came down to wash herself at the river. And her maidens walked along by the riverside. And when she saw the ark among the flags, she sent her maid to fetch it. And when she opened it, she saw the child, and behold, the babe wept. And she had compassion on him and said, This is one of the Hebrew children. You see, she put him in the ark. Her plan goes into action. Or let me say, instead of her plan going into the action, into action God's plan went into action you say this mother had enough faith to trust God that she wasn't going to allow her son to die but it even gets better than that in verse 7 and 8 it says then said his sister to Pharaoh's daughter shall I go and call to thee a nurse of the Hebrew women that she may nurse the child for thee and Pharaoh's daughter said to her, Go. And the maid went and called the child's mother. Now, she has already set God's plan in action. That she's going to put that child in the ark to protect him. But she's going to put him in the reeds. Not out in the water where he'll float away. But in the reeds where when the maids go down to bathe. That they're going to find him. And they're going to bring him to Pharaoh's daughter's. Yochebed may have not known that. But God knew that. You may not know everything that God has in plan for your children, but God knows everything, and He'll use you to get that child ready for His service, to serve Him. And so she put that child where He would be found. But yet it even gets better. If you'll notice in verse 9, it said, And Pharaoh's daughter said unto her, Take this child away and nurse it for me, and I will give thee thy wages. And the woman took the child and nursed it. Now wait a minute. Do you get that picture? Here, Moses' mother puts him in the little ark and temporarily gives him up because she wants to protect him. And when this Egyptian woman gets him, She's going to make a son out of him. And Miriam, all the time, is standing by watching. And guess where Miriam goes? She goes right back to her mother. So here, all this protecting and providing that 
Jochebed is done for her child. Now she's being rewarded. Because this child that she gave away, she gets to raise him. And she brings him back and takes care of him and nurses him. And then we find out she takes him back. After a period of time, she takes him back to Pharaoh's daughter. And you ask, why would she do that? Simply because she promised and because she trusted God. And let me tell you, both are important. And the story gets even deeper. We know that Moses eventually grows up and he winds up leading the Jewish people back to the promised land in Canaan, but it's a story that we don't have time for this morning. So, In the book of Hebrews, we find Moses at 35 years old. And the scripture says about him in Hebrews, when he come to age, he refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter. In fact, he's probably about 40 years old now. Because in those days it was considered that a person was old enough to make decisions for himself when he's 40 years old. And so he says, I'm not going to be called Pharaoh's daughter. But the scripture said rather he chose to suffer the afflictions with God's people than he had to join, enjoy the pleasure of sin for a season. Because he had respect for the recompense of reward. In other words, he knew what the reward was if he lived in sin as Pharaoh's daughter. So he says, I'm not going to be Pharaoh's daughter. Well, after 30, probably 35 years, and why would I say 35 years? Because a child in those days were usually four to six years old before they were weaned. And so that means Jacobin probably had her son for four to six years before she took him back to Pharaoh's daughter. What's the implication here? I think the implication is that during those four to six years, probably <coughs> she constantly taught that boy about Yahweh, or about God, about Jehovah. Did all that she could to instill with him the values of being a boy that would grow up and serve God. <coughs> and I believe that's, why do I believe that? Because there is groups that says, give us your child until they're five years old, and they will never be nothing but what we <coughs> teach them. You see, a child is most teachable in those young years. I've actually known of mothers that said they read to their babies while they were still in the womb. And that child turned out to be love reading. My daughter did that uh, for her son. And that boy, he doesn't read very well. But that boy has, he can grasp whatever you tell him, a year later he's going to remember it. Mm -hmm. His mama constantly talked to him before he was born. I'm persuaded that <coughs> Jacobed raised her son up to be a godly child. And when he come to age, he refused to be anything else. So let's conclude with this. Bible scholars know that any, any time that we're talking about Egypt, Egypt is represented as a type of the world. You see, those Hebrews had left Canaan, the promised land. They had gone down to Egypt, back into the world, to make a living. The world was good to them for a while. But after a while, the world wasn't so good. John tells us in, in, uh, in 1 John, all that's in the world is the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. Simply what he's saying to us is that all that's in the world is sin. You see, when a child goes out into the world, that child is living in sin. I don't understand it, but the Amish have what they call rumspring. When they send their children out, from the home 
end of the world for that child to experience the English type of life, they say. And then they decide whether they want to come back and be Amish or not. Most of those children go out and live the party life and they never come back because they like the party life better. All that's in the world is sin. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And when someone goes out into the world, someone will set it right. It'll take you further than you want to go. Those Jews wanted to go to Egypt for food, and they wound up in slave labor. Sin will cost you more than you ever wanted to pay. It cost them slave labor, and eventually it cost them the death of the children. Jacobet said, it's not going to happen to my son. And she stood up. It cost them more than they wanted to pay. And when sin is finished, it breaks forth death. You see, sin still doing the same thing in families today. It's tearing families apart. And a lot of those families that are being torn apart is because somebody failed to teach their children that it's important to live with God. You see, we've got to this age now. I remember years ago in the 80s, we were pastoring <coughs> over the And I remember visiting this one lady that had a small child. And then I remember my wife visiting that lady and another member of the church with her visiting this lady. And the lady said to them and she said to me, she said, I'll let my child make up her mind what she wants to do. And I guess I was kind of an arrogant fellow even worse then than I am now. My wife says if that's, if that's possible. But I remember saying to that lady, I said, are you going to allow her to make up her mind Monday morning whether she wants to go to school or not? She said, oh no, she's got to go to school. It's important that she learns so she can make a good living. I said, well, church is just equally as well important because it's there that she learns to live good. But today, we hear that more than we did then. People will say, I let them make up their own mind what they want to do. And if we look around us, we see mom and dad in church, but no children, teenage children. One of the things that we're missing more than anything else in church today is teenage children. I really believe, folks, that's because mom didn't set her foot down and say, you're going to church. But you're just not going to church. You're going to see me live godly in front of you. I'm going to be your shining example so you'll want to go. We're blessed our daughter never thinks about missing church. So America's being, the church is being robbed of their young folks. Our churches especially, and I'm told by pastor brethren that I know in other denominations that they're facing the same crisis, that their churches are fastly depleting because no young people are coming to church. And the world is gobbling them up. We're hearing more and more young people that are getting in trouble. I mean, what happens here when you have a 17-year-old walks into a building and starts shooting people? The world is engulfing people and it's taking them further than they ever tended to go. And in the end, it's going to cost them more than they ever wanted to pay. And homes are broken and destroyed. So we need somebody to stand up. Jacob stood up for Egypt. Or stood up in Egypt. 
and rescued a nation because she raised a son that would lead them back to the promised land. We need mothers to stand up today and rescue their children so the children can lead us, even as free will Baptists, back to what we ought to be. Back to full houses on Sunday morning and Sunday evening and Wednesday night. I remember, I remember just a few years ago preaching with a packed house. I remember years ago when we pastored over in Cookville. We had over on this side of what we call a spillover. And it had, it had a bunch of pews back there. Our church grows so fast with young people that finally we filled that up. Then after a while, we had to put chairs on the stage. And people sat on the stage. We put chairs at the end of the aisle and people sat there. Eventually, they did build a new building, but it's years after we left. We don't see that today. We need somebody to stand up. And I'm going to be honest with you, man, if that somebody is, is probably going to be one of our women. I encourage you men to stand up. But if tradition holds, it's going to be a woman. I will tell you that in Hebrews chapter 11, it does say that his mother and father. But everywhere else we read about this story, it's all about Jacob doing something for her son. So we need women to stand up. And so therefore, instead of condemning them, we need to encourage them. We need to praise them for what they are doing and encourage them to do more. So this morning, I thank you ladies for what you've done for our church down through the years. I encourage you to stand up and do more because this nation needs to be turned around. Maybe you're here this morning and you'd like to be that person Dwight L. Moody, I'm going to ask for a song this morning, if you will. Dwight L. Moody was a shoe salesman. And this man walked into the shoe store where he was working and made one simple statement. He said, it's yet to be seen what can be done with a man that's totally sold out to God. Dwight L. Moody made this statement. He said, I'm going to be that man. Dwight L. Moody from that day forth never failed to find somebody as long as he was able to get out of his bed, never failed to find somebody to witness to every day. In fact, he got so bad in the Chicago church, people would come to the, to the deacons in the church and say to them, Moody is aggravating us to death. I remember a fellow that got saved years ago, and he said, he first of all looked around, and he was a grown man with children, he first looked around at his children, and he said to his children, he said, you don't have to worry about daddy anymore. He said, daddy's all right with the Lord. He said, second of all, I had to get saved because this preacher was aggravating me to death every, Sunday, every Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. I was working during the week in pastoring, but every Saturday morning I'd knock on Norman's door. 10 o'clock, 10 o'clock. Dwight L. Moody said he never failed, but one night he had already come in and eat his meal and gone to bed and it was pouring out the rain, pouring down the rain, and he remembered after he went to bed that he hadn't witnessed anybody that day. He got up and he looked out. There was a man standing on the street lamp trying to shelter himself from the rain. Moody took his umbrella, went out, and stood holding an umbrella over that man and witnessed to him and led him to the Lord. We need somebody today. Now, you don't have to be a, a lady 
to answer this invitation. If you're willing to be that person, we're going to invite you to come down this morning at this altar just for a word of prayer. Would you stand with us while we sing? Would you come and be that person this morning? I'm going to make a difference. I'm not going to allow my children to part this life not knowing the Lord. I'm going to do all I can. Don't.